Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Pre Desai and we go into more detail on the Lao. So decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs have had a bit of a resurgence in popularity lately. The Lao is a for-profit limited liability autonomous organization. It's a smart contract based investment club. Sound interesting? Early 2020, the Lao opened and quickly raised over $5 million to fund blockchain startups based on its community members' votes. The Lao has since made a number of investments and seems to be off to a great start. The new version of venture capital? We'll see. We dive into all things the Lao, the history of the DAO, and why this investment vehicle might be worth investigating further for investors interested in the blockchain space. Before you listen, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast, or even better, leave a review. This really helps more people find the podcast and keeps this thing going. It really, really helps. The Lao, DAOs, and all things venture in crypto. Enjoy this conversation with Pre Desai. Morning, Pre. Welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Excited to have you. So I wanted to start off just with a little bit of your background and what you're doing. Sure. Um, so I lead operations for a project called Open Law, which recently um, uh, put out the Lao here, launched that back in April. Um, you know, I've been with the Open Law team for about close to three years now, which is crazy. Uh, prior to that, I was a law student, um, kind of fell down the rabbit hole even further into the space in law school. Um, and then before law school, I uh, worked in politics, so sort of a left turn here. But I was in D.C. for several several years. Um, and and I mean, if you're curious, I guess the story of how I fell into this space was more from like a political social perspective. Um, so like in, in, you know, my father used to talk a lot about this. He's definitely um, one of those like gold bug, hardcore uh type of like James Rickards currency wars type of guy. And so found out like the, the this Bitcoin thing back in like 2014, 2015, maybe even actually he was talking about it earlier than that. Uh, but I was in DC at the time, found it interesting. And then in law school, um, wanted to write about Bitcoin. Aaron Wright, the co-founder of Open Law was actually a professor at my law school. So I found him, um, asked him if he would kind of co-author, at least supervise uh, my my law school note on Bitcoin. And he actually introduced me to Ethereum. So that was like 2015, 2016, um, I believe. And so wrote a paper on Ethereum and then kind of worked with him um, my entire last year of law school. And then that was when the whole um, DAO hack happened. People were trying to figure out whether that was security or not. I remember writing a paper for my securities law class about that. So from there, the space, I think, just blew up, you know, thereafter, shortly thereafter, was like the ICO boom and, and um, out kind of came up, came a open on all these other incredible projects. So um, I, I, yeah, it's been an interesting uh, ride uh, in this space, but I, I feel like every month is like a year. It's, it's like dog years. It's crazy. And the amount of innovation happening at breakneck speed, it's, it's really overwhelming and hard to keep track of. A lot of it, um, especially right yeah. now. I mean, we're recording in September uh, 2020, and there's a lot going on right now. Yeah. It's crazy to think that, like, Bitcoin really is only, like, 11 years old. So Also, it's, yeah. So yeah, but happened. it's, like, dog years. It, that's yeah. interesting. I mean, so uh, your father introduced you. I mean, Currency Wars, the the book, I forget the author, <laughs> but uh, Creature from Jekyll Island, like, these these books were so influential in me, like, being becoming really. more of a, a believer in Bitcoin, at least questioning these things that you never questioned before, right? So I think those those were quite influential for me as well. So tell me a little bit more about Open Law, what you guys do. I, I mean, obviously we'll get into the the Lao, but what else does Open Law do? Yeah, so Open Law really wants to build out this generic legal layer that sits on top of blockchain. So um, by that, I mean, like, and, and you're familiar with smart contracts, I'm sure your audience is fairly familiar, but just to kind of like strip down all the hype, I mean, if you look at a smart contract, it, it really is just code transferring one digital asset to um, someone else. And that digital asset can be crypto native like ETH or Bitcoin, or that digital asset can be um, representing real world assets like 
you know, intellectual property rights, real property rights, um, you know, whatever, whatever that token may be. Um, but if you want to give that digital asset any sort of real world significance, you need to have those rights and obligations memorialized through some sort of paper document. So um, in this case, it's, a, you know, a legal agreement. Um, so what we do with open law is we can take any legal agreement, convert that through our domain specific markup language into a data object that sort of wraps the smart contracts. And then you can digitally sign um, the agreement, have that signature memorialized on Ethereum or really any blockchain and have the agreement referenced. And then as that um, agreement, you know, gets executed, a smart contract that is in the agreement, embedded in the agreement gets called um, and you have like this full stack and, and really, you know, in our vantage point, we, we call it the Olay stack, but we think like smart contracts will sort of adapt to have this stack of like an Oracle layer and you know, in this case, like link, open law, and then Ethereum blockchain. So um, we think those that com those the combo of those three technologies is, is extremely powerful. And um, open law really is a piece of that. So we see ourselves as like a fundamental layer. Um, when, when you think about blockchain, um, you know, blockchain really is that data layer. And then on top of that, you're going to have these Legos like identity, custody through the exchanges, and then legal, which really sits between the two of those. Um, so that's that's where really we fit in, and and there's so much you can do with open law. Um, you know, there's, we've done several demos with law firms and other institutions. Um, so again, like I said, super generic and and can be used across every industry. Since legal really is pervasive in every single industry. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's open law uh, in in a nutshell. And there's obviously some components to that. I'm happy to unpack, but at a high level, that's really what we're doing here. Yeah, no, fascinating. The legal agreements, this is a, an essential building block of all of this, right? And these crypto native people want to, you know, burn burn down the institutions or whatever. But I think it's a, it's a really useful, vital part of the ecosystem. Uh, it, for this conversation, though, I'd, I'd rather focus a little bit more on the Lao, which was a project from Open Law. So maybe, maybe just talk about... Uh, where the inspiration for this was from and, and why somebody like Open Law decided to uh, push this project through? Yeah, it's a great question. So like I mentioned, Open Law is like hyper, hyper generic and, and can be applied to different products and can make building dApps faster and easier. And we at the team had been, you know, pretty animated by this idea of DAOs for quite some time. I feel, you know, both both co-founders, David Rune and Aaron Wright had been thinking about DAOs. Um, loved the idea in 2016. Um, obviously, there was some major hiccups there, but, but the idea itself um, was sound. And we felt, um, you know, with our toolkit at Open Law and this idea of like a resurgence in the DAO conversation, I think like Moloch DAO released its code, I want to say like May of last year. And I, I just remember there was like this DAO renaissance once again, like folks were really um, getting into it. And, and, and it was, kind of amazing to, to see the conversation around DAOs back like early spring of last year. And we've been, that, that has been percolating in our side. And we um, actually sort of released um, a vertical of open law called open law DAO, where you could effectively build limited liability wrappers um, using open law and really responding to the crowd. We, you know, we thought to ourselves, why don't we recreate the vision of the DAO um, the tech maturity is there from from way back when, and then not only that, like we get the team can structure structure this stuff, and we also have the toolkit um, to really bring this to life. So why don't we? Um, and so it really was um, just kind of responding to to the great feedback, and, and thought it'd be a great way to productize some of the work we did with Open Law. Um, started building on that late fall and winter and then released it um, later this spring. Uh, that, that's really where we come in. And as open law, just to kind of define the relationship between open law and the Lao, um, we are like a service provider of, of the Lao. So the Lao is entirely member managed. Um, however, we um, take a small fee just to maintain the DAP and coordinate um, between members and projects. We, you know, do some of the touch points in the real world, which unfortunately we can't avoid like annual K, mailing out annual K1s and, um, you know, maintaining legal documents 
audits and doing the legal structuring and doing the accreditation checks, things of that nature uh, we handle on, on the open law side as a software provider. Awesome. Yeah, those, those are definitely still necessary, right? So the Lao is inspired by the DAO, and we'll go into that. But so the Lao is a member directed venture fund, right? So yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. Before we jump into the Lao more, let's let's talk about the DAO, which you know, a DAO is just decentralized autonomous organization. There's Molech DAO and all of these things. There was a DAO resurgence, but when people say the DAO, what do they mean with this? Yeah, uh, it's, it's hard to forget that uh, moment. I think it was kind of a crossroads for the Ethereum community in general back in, in 2016. But um, you know, with the DAO there. Um, there was the vision actually isn't dissimilar to the Lao, but it was, was this idea of a collective hive mind of people coming together using smart contracts to on the operational side on the back end and investing in projects uh, based on a democratic voting system um so i believe if i remember correctly i think it raised like 153 million um i forgot the exact amount but it was obviously a huge deal um, it, I mean, raising that kind of capital in, in a matter of, of in that short amount of time is pretty incredible. But the, again, like the idea there was to invest and help the ecosystem grow. Um, yeah, the vision, again, we still really uh, believe in that and, and, and love the team that put that together. Unfortunately, it ran into, you know, this major hiccup um, from a technical side and um, there was the Dow, this infamous Dow hack. I actually think um, there's you know, it's it's been documented in great detail. Um, uh, I think that, I forgot his name, the Bloomberg reporter is actually writing a book specifically around the DAO um, and the hack I and mean, kind of the politics around that. Um, Camila Russo's book, The Infinite Machine, goes yeah. into a lot of detail and shines a lot of light on like what was happening. I mean, the smart contract wasn't that audited. Money started flowing in way quicker than they ever would have thought. Like that's that's a good one as well. Yeah, no, that they, she definitely, I think she has like a chapter on the Dow too. Um, yeah, no, it, it's just a crazy story. And I, it's kind of hard to not think about Ethereum without that turning point of the Dow. Um, so there's obviously a lot of conversation at that point about that, but very exciting stuff. Um, again, ran into some legal and technical issues, but profound and far as far as vision and I think it speaks to the fact that it raised so much money that people really do believe in this idea of um, pooling capital like water and distributing that in a very seamless, seamless fashion um, using smart contracts so um, you know we were very much inspired by by the uh, original DAO and actually one of the members of the Lao is Christoph who helped put that together so he himself is, is, I think, quite interested in this and, and building this out. So, yeah, I mean, we, we you know, love that project and, and I'm, are glad to see that we're seeing a resurgence in, in DAOs. Um, I think it's a huge killer app and killer use case for Ethereum. So These DAO, DAO investment vehicles, they function, from my understanding, I think you mentioned the hive mind or the wisdom of the crowds. Typically, the wisdom of the crowds isn't that right with investing decisions, right? So how do you think through how this thing is going to be successful based on the wisdom of crowds investing in early stage startups, something that perhaps they don't know much about? Like, how do you think through this? Um, I, you know, I guess I beg to differ. I actually think that the, this hive mind of people, they've made pretty good decisions. And I think that they're pretty in touch with what's happening. Like a lot of them live, breathe this stuff they had since the inception of Ethereum. They've been early on and have spotted good stuff or actually have built great protocols. We have a great like number of founders that are also members of the Lao. Um, yeah, I mean, like if you look at DeFi, if you look at some of these trends that have emerged in Ethereum and I guess in crypto in general, like traditional venture has missed much of that as well. Um, or not as well, just they've missed some of that. And, um, you know, if you look at this group of people, a lot of them have different skill sets. Some of them have scaled up companies and are running companies, um, have been since, you know, before 2017. Some of them have been um, at the 
founding floor of Ethereum. Some of them have just really uh, invested in the space. Some of them are liquidity providers in DeFi, so they know the ins and outs of every one of these protocols and know what could be improved or not improved. So we are so we, I think that there's like this emergence of operator investors, and I think that that's really what the Lao has. So when you start talking about these operator investors that are angels or, or have been angels, and then you kind of get them together. Um, you're getting a crowd of people that are experts in different subject matters. So we have, like I said, those DeFi liquidity types that, you know, no balancer from, you know, front to back. Um, we have folks who are so entrenched in the NFT digital art space. They're on every platform. They're buying art. They're selling art. They just know the emerging digital artists. They can speak to that. And I think, you know, because of that, you get a really diverse group of people that can comment uh, from their perspective. And, you know, we have some people on the venture side, some people on the um, operational side of all these startups and you get that mixed together and actually good decisions do come out of it. And that's really the thesis of of the of both the DAO and the DAO, um, this idea of people just, you know, being living on crypto Twitter all day and making decisions and voting on it. And I mean, you hope that um, that that democratic system of voting, but I mean, from my vantage point, sitting, listening to the members deliberate on certain projects, both on the calls and in our discord, that's like very active. Um, you know, I, I've learned a ton and, and I think they're all, you know, coming at it from different angles. And so it brings a different perspective. Um, so, I mean, I, I actually think that the hive mind does, does work, um, especially when it comes to this space and so many of these like siloed industries, like traditional venture kind of miss the boat. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think it's working so far. Nice. Yeah, well, I mean, having a diversity of opinions really changes the way I think about, you know, this hive mind sort of thing. If you have a, a, a good collection of diverse opinions, uh, especially these uh, startup operators slash investors, these, these are great people to make these investment decisions, right? So walk me through some of the events, like the track record. So uh, the Lao launched earlier this year. It's made, it's raised X amount of uh, ether. It's it's made X um, investments. Can I walk me through an update thus far? Yeah. So um, we launched uh, the Lao at the end of April, so April 28th. Um, and since then, we've just compounded both interest and and growth. Um, so the membership has just increased. Um, I think you know we have a close to 55 different members. Um, and the Lao is actually closed at this time, um, but we've raised, I think, you know, the, 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 the price of ETH is always um, fluctuating, but it's about 12,000 ETH right now. Time it closed, I think it was like 5.3 million. So that's the uh, number of um, assets under management at the, at the time. Um, we've just since launch have, you know, invested in projects. Um, so there's a nice cadence with the investments that we've had. Um, there's actually an interesting uh, deliberation between the members currently. Um, so legally, we can't have more than 100 members. So we have to have up to 99 members. Um, so right now, as I mentioned, we have about 55. Um, I think the members are considering opening it up for um, an additional 40 for members or, or whatever that um, access is. So hopefully at that point, we'll like even increase the uh, the amount of ETH that's in there. But I mean, since then, just to kind of give you a sense of like the portfolio, um, you know, we've had a wide range of projects um, get funding. Our first was Tornado Cash, which is in the privacy preserving space, awesome project. Um, from there, we invested in Super Rare, which is in the NFT digital art space. Um, we also, yeah, I think a lot of the members wanted some exposure to the options insurance space. Um, there's, you know, clear need for that in the DeFi uh, world at the moment. So Potion and, and Todd Finance were both really interesting projects with awesome founders. Um, and I, I, from there also like personal tokens is another one. So Roll was another investment and that, that, that space is like about to pop a um, lot of interest on the social token side. So. I think that, you know, because as I mentioned, the members have a lot of interest. Um, we've been able to have this diverse uh, portfolio as of late. So 
things have been moving. Um, we have a couple other DAOs that we are also going to um, probably announce in the in the near future here, but uh, maybe I'll save that for later in the conversation. Yeah, sure. That's exciting. Definitely made a note of that. We'll bring it up. So yeah. the process, so 12,000 ETH came in, it's like $4.3 million right now, 55 members. The decisions are all decentralized and then thus decided by this collective. So you put out a vote and you say, we'll increase this up to 99. You're limited because of legal uh, to, to not go above that, obviously. Uh, and then these 55 members vote based on the amount of money they've contributed to the fund. They have voting shares Correct. and they say, open it up or close it, right? Yeah. And then the uh, the process for investing. So so that's like uh, governance, I guess, of the DAO. But the process is I, I, I'm basically, I'm a member of the DAO or not. I propose this this project for investment and then all the members vote on it. Well, walk me through what this looks like. Yeah, so that's kind of been a fun experiment. Um, you know, we didn't really know how that deal flow would operate before we launched and, you know, we kind of wanted it to happen organically. So the way that it's emerged is twofold. Um, you know, a lot of these members are really playing close, close, close attention to the space. Um, you know, they're on crypto Twitter, they're talking to people. Uh, so a lot of what the interesting projects that come through are brought in through members. Um, so they'll find something, they'll see something, uh, you know, raise it in our Discord. There'll be a little bit of chatter. We might create a, you know, channel specific on this project, specifically about this project. People will play around and chat about it. A member or myself will, you know, just reach out to the project, gather some basic information, super quick call just to understand um, what the project is about, like their team, you know, the product and, and whether they're fundraising or, or what their situation is there. And if not, like how we can help them otherwise, um, if there's a lot of interest around the project. Uh, so long, sorry, that was kind of long winded, but um, I'll do that initial kind of outbound, um, share that with the members or, or the member themselves will also do that bond if they're talking to them separately. And we have these weekly calls uh, two a week uh, where members will discuss it, uh, just discuss the project in more uh, greater length. We'll take that to um, the Discord. The conversation will just continue to flow. Uh, generally speaking, the members want to talk to the founders and meet the founders. So we'll work on, you know, putting together a member call uh, between the members and, and then the projects themselves. Um, and uh, really from there, uh, the members kind of quickly know whether or not they want to, um, you know, propose that project for votes. So if they are, we'll signal to the project that there's definitely a lot of interest as so they should apply through our, you know, application process. And then a member will nominate it and um, there'll be a one week voting period. Um, and if there are more yeses than nos, um, that capital is committed through a smart contract. Um, it doesn't get deployed into the project uh, or the founders yet, we have a one week grace period where any members that potentially may, or may be unhappy with that decision or would uh, like to, uh, or would like, or just in general unhappy with the, with the allow itself, they may be able to rage quit um, and take any undeployed capital, at which point thereafter the project gets, gets funded and all the legal documents get signed. So, that's the process um, in, in, in one regard. And I would say most of the time, that's how the deals have been flowing. Um, there's also the case where projects apply to the Lao. Um, and I mean, this happened recently where a project applied to the Lao uh, will bring it uh, to the members. They think it's really interesting or cool. We'll learn more about it and then nominate the proposal. So really it's either inbound or outbound is, is um, just a long way of answering that question. Um, but I, I will say, like, surprisingly, I think there were some questions initially with the LAO, like whether or not there would be deal flow, whether or not projects would be comfortable with this, like, group of people or a DAO investing in them. Um, but I, that hasn't been the case. In fact, a lot of the projects are pretty excited about this, like, group of folks who are really, you know, excited about supporting them. So um, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, I, I had an interview with the the guy from WeFunder talking about crowdfunding in general, and it's surprisingly founders are open to these 
crowdfunding mechanisms or like in the, the, the Lao case, you know, 55 people investing in your company, basically, it's probably just one line on the cap table in this case, because it's the Dow, which is the legal or the Lao uh, legal entity. But then you suddenly get 55 ambassadors and promoters and advocates for your project. And each comes with its own network and his own specialization to actually really, hopefully, help that project succeed in the long run. So I'm Absolutely. curious about, you had mentioned the the rage quitting aspect. So the idea is that the whole collective votes on this project and, you know, it, majority rules. So number of units in the, in the Lao. So 60% vote for this thing. So that other 40% then is kind of maybe not angry, but this wasn't an investment that they wanted to go into. But because of the way that the, the Lao is structured, they then invest into this project unless they rage quit and exit the Lao completely, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. A lot of folks have asked like whether or not you can pick and choose which investments you would like to be exposed to as a member. But, uh, you know, this is a collective. So, even if you're unhappy with the investment, you are exposed to it unless you do rage quit. Um, and at that point, you have to leave the Lao entirely, but you get you do get to take any undeployed capital and you do still have exposure to those projects that you invested in prior. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really up to you. And, and that's what kind of makes this whole structure a bit fluid and interesting and completely different than normal, normal venture as well. So, um, yeah, there's a, there, it's very investor friendly in that regard. Nice. And speaking of how it's different from uh, venture in general, all of the projects that you're investing in are crypto native sort of companies. Do you yeah. all of them have tokenized shares or governance, some sort of token representing the investment or uh, or is it sometimes just equity? It's, it's really both. Um, so it can be token or it can be equity. Uh, so we have invested in some equity only projects as well. I know that the Lao doesn't have an investment thesis or anything. It's kind of determined by the Lao members. But what is what is the time horizon for these sorts of things? I mean, it, it just launched this year, so we can't say if it's been successful or not. Uh, I don't know. In 10 years, we'll find out. Right. Um, but yeah. What, when, when you're talking to investors uh, or potential investors, you know, how do they think through this timeline or or strategy or all of this? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, it's funny. Uh, initially, like when the Lao launched, there's definitely like we even still have a thread in the Discord about like Lao thesis. Like, what how, what what are we going to target? Are we going to be the first money in? Um, how do we want to operate? And actually, like a lot of the members at the end of that conversation were like, you know, it's probably just best not to define that and see how this evolves. Um, like we don't want to, as a collective, like turn down great opportunities because we're decided we only want to be the first money in. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to speak for the members, but there definitely seems to be um, a bent towards having projects or investments uh, in projects that have a product so not like that white paper pre-product phase um so so i mean there's definitely like these exceptions up but for the most part i think folks really want to see some product and, and and traction um and whether or not that's you know they, they don't want to preclude themselves as far as which round but um yeah I, I mean i don't know if that answers your question fully uh around the thesis but it's still like evolving um you know i think it's really up to the members where they want to take that, uh, you know, maybe over the next couple of years, uh, as more capital gets called and the fund just grows, or there's people rage quitting, people coming in and out with new capital, um, it might change to like Ethereum only. You know, it could evolve to another chain or something like that. So it's very, you know, dependent on on what the members want. Um, you know, initially it kind of was did start out as like a, an Ethereum fund, but we've talked and looked at some polka dot projects um so you know the, it really just depends on on a, a what the members are are thinking um and and what's trending at the moment um again sorry i don't know if that's like a satisfying answer but no well don't worry i'll ask more questions if it's not <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah so so that's i i mean that's interesting i i guess upon first glance i thought it was ethereum only token only but it sounds like there's a mix of equity and all sorts of things 
So I'm curious with, uh, because it's, it's community uh, member driven, if the community decides they want to invest in a restaurant in a local town or real estate or something like that so far away from crypto, technically it could? Um, I guess technically it could. I mean, I'd have to probably look into the operating agreement, um, but, you know, because with, with how these structures actually operate, maybe there's like, oftentimes there's only like a 20% side pocket kind of fund where you could do uh, other alternative type investments. Um, the way it allows is structured because there's no, GP or general partner is entirely member managed. They could presumably do that. That just hasn't really been the case. Um, but you, and I don't think it will be, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it could, I guess, presumably. Okay. So, so the consensus view is stay within crypto, stay within this like decentralization movement without it explicitly being part of the investment thesis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's definitely the ethos of the project. It's all crypto native, the members themselves, you know, they've self-selected into a project that is investing in Ethereum and decentralized technology. So I would say like, if there is a thesis, it's pretty broad, but it's, I would, you know, venture to say that the members and would agree with me here that it's more uh, investments in decentralized technology and really pushing the space forward. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think all of them are pretty committed and have, have either worked in the space, have, you know, invested in the space, helped launch uh, a lot of uh, help co-launch um, Ethereum in, in some regard in, in the space. So um, there's definitely a, a, a leaning towards a decentralized tech with the members. Well, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, the minimum buy-in was what? Uh, how many ETH? Yeah, it was um, 120 ETH initially. And then that changed uh, based on uh, the number of investments we had at one point. So there was, that was our first governance proposal where uh, the current members uh, passed a proposal to increase the buy-in amount because for every new member that comes in, they get diluted. Um, so it was only fair to really increase the um, premium to join the LAO right. for any prospective members. Yeah, so I mean, they've got significant investments in the space that's over thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 So. Um, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense that this would stay within the crypto uh, world. Just wanted to throw you that <laughs> yeah. singer there. You know, beyond just like, a, because I would say the Lao is definitely like more of a broad based Ethereum um, investment fund um, or like a whatever you want to call that. But um, we also are thinking about other collectives that can come together and invest in different pieces of decentralized technology. So, for example, um, we are thinking about putting together a DAO called Flamingo. Um, we'll probably announce that in a few weeks, but it's a collective of people who are super into the NFT space, whether that be gaming assets, digital art, um, you know, ENS domains, whatever uh, your fancy there. Um, but the idea is to like get that group and, and start buying NFTs. Um, thinking about fractionalizing them for each of the members of the collective, which is pretty interesting. There's different aspects of that. You could take it, but um, the fundamental, I guess, thesis or interest of uh, and the purview of the um, the, uh, the that DAO, the Flamingo DAO itself, is to invest in NFTs or purchase NFTs, um, and then they could lend NFTs from there if they want. So there's a lot of things that they could do, um, but that's something that we're thinking about putting together. Um, we're also thinking about putting together uh, a DAO for liquidity. So, um, you know, pulling together folks' assets, uh, folks' as assets, so they can start thinking about, um, you know, all of those parking your cash and 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 an exchange like Uniswap or Balancer and and earn those those uh, provider fees. So you could do that as a collective as well. Um, so that's, that, those are some other avenues that we're, we're thinking, but we definitely are focused on the crypto native side. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, those are those are great ideas and good use cases for the DAO structure. And you definitely have figured it out with the LAO, how to do it legally, safely, all of these things. When you're talking to new investors, so say you open this thing up to another 40 people, what is mm -hmm. the elevator pitch for them uh, for investing in some, some sort of structure like the Lao? Um, I mean, that's a great question. So it really depends on who we're talking to and, and 
uh, what their interest is. I mean, most of them know and have like a like some friend or or some connection to the Lao, but um, generally, I mean, it's not dissimilar from just describing the structure as uh, as I did prior. So, I mean, when you start thinking about this idea of protocol founders, early Ethereum folks, um, people who've just been investing and thinking about uh, what projects and what avenues um, are needed and necessary to to really build out this entire crypto native ecosystem. Um, you know, that, that's really what we're trying to build. And you, and you have this collective hive mind of people. So um, that, I mean, that's also, I think, why folks want exposure to this, because it's not, it's not just um, an opportunity to, you know, invest in, in cool projects, but it's also a way to like meet like-minded individuals, meet projects that you might not normally get exposure to and um, learn from other people and in other interest areas. So I think that's, that's been a huge, um, you know, motivating factor for people to join um, a lot of people also like this idea of experimenting in the space this idea of having an investment collective or a DAO is super compelling I think for people who've been around um, we've had folks that were uh, members of the original DAO and and were pretty upset to see that kind of go out the way it did so reliving that vision through the Lao is is a great opportunity for them um, and I mean, a lot of people have been following this loosely and, and you know, have invested in the space. So having um, kind of e expanding their own personal portfolio and, and their exposure to these different projects is pretty compelling as well. I think it's this weird experiment and that, that there's a certain type of person that would want to join that. So um, it's like pretty, I think a lot of it are just, a lot of it is just Read off like folks's curiosity and, and wanting to join in a structure like this. Um, and um, I think people see how fast we're moving, how different it is from venture, how we're trying to streamline a lot of these operations and legal and make everything quick and fast through smart contracts and voting mechanisms that they just want to be a part of it. Um, and and um, like I said, it's reliving that vision of the DAO that never really got to happen and so I think folks folks like it um and it's all an experiment so I think people are willing to roll those dice and that's the, that's the kind yeah. of the cool thing about people in crypto is like they see something new and they just are curious and want to dig in so it's uh it's great and have enough investable cash for a thirty thousand uh, dollar experiment <laughs> yeah no but uh, I uh, jokes aside I mean I do think it's a, a great idea and I, looking forward to watching it closely uh, over the coming years, that's for sure. So it is an experiment. And thus far, what what has been the biggest surprise in running this thing for the last, well, four, four months? Um, good question. Um, I'm pretty, like, I guess it's not surprising now, but I guess early on, I was surprised to see the number of projects that really wanted a DAO investment. Like a lot of folks will reach out to are like super pumped about this idea. A lot of project founders like love this idea of having a collective of different people from different backgrounds investing in them. Like I, I, didn't, I never really um, thought there would, I didn't, I didn't fully con compute to me that uh, project founders would really, you know, find it interesting. I thought for them more, it was like a fast way to get capital and focus on product and, and not necessarily you know, have to spend, you know, four to eight weeks with a VC trying to get funding, you know, pretty quickly with the Lao and it's pretty like people are on top of it. So, I, you know, I thought that would be more of the appeal, but rather it was actually, you know, this idea of a, a new structure investing in them and, and having this obvious to me now, but having this like group of 50 people who are early on in the space, uh, promoting their projects and supporting it and making connections and a lot of folks, a lot of the Lao project founders have reached out for, you know, job postings or whatever their needs are. And I just kind of send that off to the Lao members and they pass it on to me and, and we'll help fill roles for them. So, I mean, it's like this whole network that they've um, been able to get along with investments. And um, that to some extent is more valuable. Like we've had a lot of uh, startups that are oversubscribed, but we'll reach out and they're like, really thrilled to make room for the wow and I, I think that's super cool i think like it, it makes me feel that not only are uh, the members of the wow 
really to will, willing to like take you know the financial risk and the time and everything to experiment with something like the structure but so are the project founders themselves like they really like this idea they're committed to have everything crypto native and, and get investments from DAOs. and i think that seeing that come from from their side has been pretty amazing and um i guess on that note on a personal note like being able to talk to founders all the time is tremendous like i, I don't think i'm like a founder type at all but i definitely love talking to founders and working with founders and i think just learning um from them and having those like quick 30 minute calls with them has been like a huge uh benefit and like making my job pleasurable like i just feel like i learned so much from them so i really enjoy that piece um of, of this job uh so far but yeah yeah there's a lot i just said there but yeah. the point is i think i think i think it's great to see the crypto community embrace um, and, and, and like venture is fine, but I, I, traditional venture is fine, but like this idea of, you know, decentralizing it out of Silicon Valley and having money pulled from like all over the world by different people is super compelling to them. And I think that's great. Um, that's exactly what we want to see. And I think that that attitude is really going to push this ecosystem along. Cause I mean, I guess it would make sense since we all have like that decentralized, um, attitude and, and this idea of breaking things apart so um and then making things better and, and rebuilding so um yeah i guess i'm a bit surprised by that from their from their vantage point decentralized yes but you are omnipresent in the areas that i see you and i know you're doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes so i know you and the rest of the team are working really really hard to make this thing work and function so seamlessly so Hats off to you and the team. I know you guys are working really hard and a, a lot of people recognize that as well. Um, Great. And on, on, on that, I mean, it, it sounds like it's, it's going really well and great thus far, but what has, been, what has been the biggest hurdle so far? Yeah, I mean, I will say things have gone, you know, leaps and bounds better than I anticipated. Um, I guess the hurdle is like we, I, there's a couple of things, I guess. Um, we tend to move really fast so you know we compared to working with other um and com compared to you know a, a project working with traditional vc so like you know allow the law will have a project that they find interesting and within like you know a few weeks of chat me chatting with them them talking about it you know whatever we there there's a decision can be made quite quickly um so challenge has been kind of waiting for the co-investors to figure out what the terms are and wrap up so then we can you know close that fully close the loop on that it's not even really a hurdle it just takes longer than what our timeline is so it's more just being patient in that regard um, but it's not you know a massive uh, deal I think um, another <laughs> hurdle has been kind of the gas cost um, so you know we have a very active community of members at the Lau, um, but you'll notice on the voting, a lot of folks that they see more yeses than nos, they'll probably just bow out because they don't want to, I don't even blame them. They don't want to pay the gas cost. So I think like technically that's kind of um, a hurdle. I think um, people, so we, we're, we're a very active community. As I mentioned, like this, keeping up with our discord is honestly like borderline a full-time job. So um, just making sure everything is, is running smoothly there it takes quite a bit of effort. However, um, you know, there, there'll be phases of just having to uh, push people. I think sometimes there, there's so much going on in this space and a lot of distractions. So just um, having folks fully engaged at the same time when you're coordinating between like 50 people is oftentimes a, a, a bit difficult. But um, I mean, honestly, like I feel like it's totally manageable. It's, it's almost like in a way a good thing that that rule is doesn't say that you have to have more than 99 members because i think once you start getting past that it gets hard really hard to herd cats and like wrangle folks so um i mean i think sometimes that can be challenging but I, that's really i'm grasping i i would say for the most part things are running way way more smoothly than i anticipated and um just really quickly high level legal entity delaware llc open to foreigners like uh, accredited only what else Correct. should i know yeah there is no general partner it's all number managed um so like that whole gplp structure is something that you don't really have to deal with here um on that uh, note I, I don't know how familiar you are but traditional venture operates on this like two to 20 model 
Uh, so 2% management fee with 20% carry, which means um, any profits like realized from the investments go, 20% of that goes back to the fund itself. Um, we at the Lau actually don't take a carry, so it's super investor friendly in that regard. Um, they seek all of the benefits of, of their decision making, which obviously makes a ton of sense since they're making the decisions. Yep, Delaware LLC, open to foreign investors, everyone is accredited. We, we don't like to cut corners, so everything we do is super thorough. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything structurally. And for, um, foreigners invest? I mean, obviously certain jurisdictions are excluded, but um, most most foreigners can. Yes, they can um, under Reg S, yeah. Okay. I mean, I wanted to give you a, a chance, like a call for projects. So it sounds like deal flow has not been an issue, but obviously you have Flamingo, which is NFT. So any cool NFT projects, you have this liquidity DAO, which also will be really cool. But um yeah, speaking to people with investable projects, like who who are you looking for and why? Honestly, it's a pretty broad umbrella. So if you're someone who wants to receive, if you're, first of all, we want like a great talented pool of, you know, founders and we want to support them in any way we can. So with any, you know, any regard uh, there, if you're interested in a project, just kind of shoot that over to us. You're more than welcome to like hit us up on Telegram. We're more than happy to pass along your information to the members or you could apply directly. Um, you know, there isn't, like I said, much of an umbrella except for you're working in the decentralized space. So if you're in that, you know, like, and it also would be great to also be at a stage where you have some level of product. Um, you know, uh, the ICO boom with the white papers and all of that, I think everyone feels a little burdened by that. So we want to see some traction to product. Um, and on the NFT, if you're someone who'd like to either join as a member or if you're a digital artist or in the gaming space or you think that, that could be interesting to you in, in one way or another, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, same goes for Liquidity DAO. Um, you know, we're going to be doing the NFT DAO before Liquidity DAO, but that's coming soon. Um, yeah. Uh, and I mean, if you're a member that likes to join the WoW, I think we have quite a lengthy, like, not, I don't want to say wait list, but a group of folks who are interested in joining um, those last 40 uh, seats. Um, so if you're interested, let us know. We're happy to jump on a call and chat. And if you're a project that wants to learn more, again, we have weekly community calls. And um, I would also like to add, uh, this is kind of left field, but we you know, have a great group of mentors also as part of the LAO. So we're trying to have like these, you know, every two months, every six, eight weeks or something, have a meeting um, with the LAO mentors and all the project founders to help support them. Would that be like, you know, how to pitch uh, a, a journalist, how to set up a bank account, you know, it's tough with crypto companies. Um, our next one is about legal and regulatory issues our last one and our first one um, of the first cohort of projects was we talked a little bit about governance tokens um, so we're really trying to do that so if you're interested in becoming a mentor of the LAO you know we'd love to have a great group of folks we've already collected um, a nice uh, a strong group of mentors who can help on the communication side can help on the marketing legal regulatory uh, scaling of product um, operations, things of that nature. So um, if you're interested in that or have that kind of skill set uh, behind you, please let me know. Love to have you on board there too. Awesome. Great stuff. And I'll, I'll make sure and list a lot of that in the show notes. So Pre, really appreciate you coming on. Where can people find out more about you, about the Lao? Where do you want to send people? Telegram, I basically live on. Uh, so at Pre, Desai, P-R-I-D-E-S-A-I. I think that's my Twitter handle as well, too. So either or, I'm pretty responsive on there. Awesome. Really appreciate it, Pri. Lots of good information in here. I think my listeners are really going to enjoy it. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. There you have it. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate your support. Show notes, transcript, links, and more can be found on our website at altassetallocation.com. If you'd be so kind, please share this with anyone you think might be interested or get some value from this conversation. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out. I'm always happy to hear them. 
Lastly, if you're on YouTube, please like the video or subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the audio version of this, please subscribe to the podcast and or leave a review. This really helps more people find the podcast and I really appreciate it. Thanks again and hope you have a fantastic day. Happy investing.